Good evening and welcome to the Deanery at Canterbury on this evening in uh, October as we read together after supper. Uh, I'm choosing tonight a, a short story by Somerset Maugham and Maugham had a, a, a long connection with Canterbury. He was here at school, at our King's School, Canterbury, the Cathedral School here in the precincts. And at the end of his life, uh, he, he left his library to the, the school. So we, we have within the precincts the Maugham Library. But this is just a short story of his, and it's called The Verger. There had been a christening that afternoon at St Peter's Neville Square, and Albert Edward Foreman still wore his verger's gown. He kept his new one, its folds as full and stiff as though it were made not of alpaca, but of perennial bronze for funerals and weddings. St Peter's Neville Square was a church much favoured by the fashionable for those ceremonies. And now he wore only his second best, he wore it with complacence, for it was the dignified symbol of his office, and without it, when he took it off to go home, he had the disconcerting sensation of being somewhat insufficiently clad. He took pains with it. He pressed it and ironed it himself. During the 16 years he had been verger of this church, he had had a succession of such gowns, but he had never been able to throw them away when they were worn out, and the complete series, neatly wrapped up in brown paper, lay in the bottom drawers of the wardrobe in his bedroom. The verger busied himself quietly, replacing the painted wooden cover on the marble font, taking away a chair that had been brought for an infirm old lady, and waited for the vicar to have finished in the vestry so that he could tidy up in there and go home. Presently he saw him walk across the chancel, genuflect in front of the high altar and come down the aisle, but he still wore his cassock. What's he hang in about for? the verger said to himself. Don't he know I want my tea? The vicar had been but recently appointed. A red-faced, energetic man in the early forties, and Albert Edward still regretted his predecessor, a clergyman of the old school, who preached leisurely sermons in a silvery voice and dined out a great deal with his more aristocratic parishioners. He liked things in church to be just so, but he never fussed. He was not like this new man, who wanted to have his finger in every pie. But Albert Edward was tolerant. St Peter's was in a very good neighbourhood, and the parishioners were a very nice class of people. The new vicar had come from the East End, and he couldn't be expected to fall in all at once with the discreet ways of his fashionable congregation. All this hustle, said Albert Edward, but give him time, you'll learn. When the vicar had walked down the aisle so far that he could address the verger without raising his voice more than was becoming in a place of worship, he stopped. Foreman, will you come into the vestry for a minute? I have something to say to you. Very good, sir. The vicar waited for him to come up and they walked up the church together. A very nice christening, I thought so. Funny how the baby stopped crying the moment you took him. I've noticed they very often do, said the vicar with a little smile. After all, I've had a good deal of practice with them. It was a source of subdued pride to him that he could nearly always quiet a whimpering infant by the manner in which he held it and he was not unconscious of the amused admiration with which mothers and nurses watched him settle the baby in the crook of his surplus arm. The virgin knew that it pleased him to be complimented on his talent. The vicar preceded Albert Edward into the vestry. 
Albert Edward was a trifle surprised to find the two church wardens there. He had not seen them come in. They gave him pleasant nods. Good afternoon, my lord. Good afternoon, sir, he said to one after the other. They were elderly men, both of them, and they had been church wardens almost as long as Albert Edward had been verger. They were sitting now at a handsome refectory table that the old vicar had brought many years before from Italy, and the vicar sat down to the vacant chair between them. Albert Edward faced them, the table between him and them, and wondered with slight uneasiness what was the matter. He remembered still the occasion on which the organist had got into trouble and the brother and the, and the bother they had all had to hush things up. In a church like St Peter's, Neville Square, they couldn't afford a scandal. On the vicar's red face was a look of resolute benignity, but the others bore an expression that was slightly troubled. He's been nagging them, he has said the verger to himself. He jockeyed them into doing something, but they don't half like it. That's what it is. You mark my words. But his thoughts did not appear on Albert Edwards' clean-cut and distinguished features. He stood in a respectful but not obsequious attitude. He had been in service before he was appointed to his ecclesiastical office but only in very good houses, and his deportment was irreproachable. Starting as a page boy in the household of a merchant prince, he had risen by due degrees from the position of fourth to first footman. For a year he had been single-handed butler to a widowed peeress, and, till the vacancy occurred at St Peter's, butler with two men under him in the house of a retired ambassador. He was tall, spare, grave and dignified. He looked, if not like a duke, at least like an actor of the old school who specialised in duke's parts. He had tact, firmness and self-assurance. His character was unimpeachable. The vicar began briskly. Foreman, we've got something rather unpleasant to say to you. You've been here a great many years, and I think his lordship and the general agree with me that you fulfilled the duties of your office to the satisfaction of everybody concerned. The two church wardens nodded. But a most extraordinary circumstance came to my knowledge the other day, and I felt it my duty to impart it to the church wardens. I discovered to my astonishment that you could neither read nor write. The verger's face betrayed no sign of embarrassment. The last vicar knew that, sir, he replied. He said it didn't make no difference. He always said there was a great deal too much education in the world for his taste. It's the most amazing thing I ever heard, cried the general. Do you mean to say that you've been verger of this church for 16 years and never learned to read or write? I went into service when I was 12, sir. The cook, in the first place, tried to teach me once, but I didn't seem to have the knack for it. And then, what with one thing and another, I never seemed to have the time. I've never really found the want of it. I think a lot of these young fellows waste a rare lot of time reading when they might be doing something useful. But don't you want to know the news, said the other churchwarden? Don't you ever want to write a letter? No, my lord. I seem to have managed very well without, and of late years, now they've all these pictures in the papers, I get to know what's going on pretty well. My wife's quite a scholar, and if I want to write a letter, she writes it for me. It's not as if I was a betting man. The two church wardens gave the vicar a troubled glance and then looked down at the table. Well, foreman, I've talked the matter over with these two gentlemen and they quite agree with me that this situation is impossible. At a church like St Peter's Neville Square, we cannot have a verger who can neither read nor write. 
Albert Edwards' thin, sallow face reddened and he moved uneasily on his feet, but he made no reply. Understand me, foreman. I have no complaint to make against you. You do your work quite satisfactorily. I have the highest opinion both of your character and of your capacity, but we haven't the right to take the risk of some accident that might happen owing to your lamentable ignorance. It's a matter of prudence as well as of principle. But couldn't you learn, foreman? said the general. No, sir, I'm afraid I couldn't do, not now. You see, I'm not as young as I was, and if I couldn't seem able to get the letters to me, Ed, when I was a nipper, I don't think there's much chance of it now. We don't want to be harsh with you, foreman, said the vicar, but the church wardens and I have quite made up our minds. We'll give you three months, and if at the end of that time you cannot read and write, I'm afraid you'll have to go. Albert Edward had never liked the new vicar. He'd said from the beginning that they'd make a mistake when they gave him St Peter's. He wasn't the type of man they wanted with a classy congregation like that. So now he straightened himself a little. He knew his value and he wasn't going to allow himself to be put upon. I'm very sorry, sir. I'm afraid it's no good. I'm too old a dog to learn new tricks. I've lived a good many years without knowing how to read and write, and without wishing to praise myself. Self-praise is no recommendation. I don't mind saying I've done my duty in that state of life in which it has pleased a merciful providence to place me, and if I could learn now, I don't know as I'd want to. In that case, foreman, I'm afraid you must go. Yes, sir. I quite understand. I shall be happy to end in my and in my resignation as soon as you find somebody to take my place. But when Albert Edward, with his usual politeness, had closed the church door behind the vicar and the two church wardens, he could not sustain the air of unruffled dignity with which he had borne the blow inflicted upon him, and his lips quivered. He walked slowly back to the vestry and hung up on its proper peg his verger's gown. He sighed as he thought of all the grand funerals and smart weddings it had seen. He tidied everything up, put on his coat and hat in hand walked down the aisle. He locked the church door behind him. He strode across the square but deep in his sad thoughts, he did not take the street that led him home, where a nice strong cup of tea awaited him. He took the wrong turning. He walked slowly along. His heart was heavy. He did not know what he should do with himself. He did not fancy the notion of going back to domestic service after being his own master for so many years. For the vicar and church wardens could say what they liked. It was he that had run St Peter's Neville Square. He could scarcely demean himself by accepting a situation. He had saved a tidy sum, but not enough to live on without doing something, and life seemed to cost more every year. He had never thought to be troubled with such questions. The vergers of St Peter's like the popes of Rome, were there for life. He had often thought of the pleasant reference the vicar would make in his sermon at Evensong, the first Sunday after his death, to the long and faithful service and the exemplary character of their late verger, Albert Edward Foreman. He sighed deeply. Albert Edward was a non-smoker and a total abstainer, but with a certain latitude, that is to say, he liked a glass of beer with his dinner, and when he was tired, he enjoyed a cigarette. It occurred to him now that one would comfort him, and since he did not carry them, he looked about him for a shop 
where he could buy a packet of gold flake. He did not at once see one and walked on a little. It was a long street with all sorts of shops in it, but there was not a single one where you could buy cigarettes. That's strange, said Albert Edward. To make sure, he walked right up the street again. No, there was no doubt about it. He stopped and looked reflectively up and down. I can't be the only man as walks along the street and wants a fag, he said. I shouldn't wonder, but what a fellow might do very well with a little shop here. Tobacco and sweets, you know. He gave a sudden start. That's an idea, he said. Strange how things come to you when you least expect it. He turned, walked home, and had his tea. You're very silent this afternoon, Albert, his wife remarked. I'm thinking, he said. He considered the matter from every point of view, and next day he went along the street and by good luck found a little shop to let that looked as though it would exactly suit him. Twenty-four hours later he had taken it, and when a month after that he left St Peter's Neville Square for ever, Albert Edward Foreman set up in business as a tobacconist and newsagent. His wife said it was a dreadful come-down after being verger of St Peter's, but he answered that you had to move with the times. The church wasn't what it was, and henceforward he was going to render unto Caesar what was Caesar's. Albert Edward did very well. He did so well that in a year or so it struck him that he might take a second shop and put a manager in. He looked for another long street that hadn't got a tobacconist in it, and when he found it, and a shop to let, took it and stocked it. This was a success too. Then it occurred to him that if he could run two, he could run half a dozen. So he began walking about London, and whenever he found a long street that had no tobacconist and a shop to let, he took it. In the course of ten years, he had acquired no less than ten shops, and he was making money hand over fist. He went round to all of them himself every Monday, collected the week's takings and took them to the bank. One morning, when he was there, paying in a bundle of notes and a heavy bag of silver, the cashier told him that the manager would like to see him. He was shown into an office and the manager shook hands with him. Mr Foreman, I wanted to have a talk to you about the money you've got on deposit with us. Do you know exactly how much it is? Uh, not within a pound or two, sir, but I've got a pretty rough idea. Apart from what you paid in this morning, it's a little over £30,000. That's a very large sum of money to have on deposit, and I should have thought you'd do better to invest it. I wouldn't want to take no risk, sir. I know it's safe in the bank. You needn't have the least anxiety. We'll make you out a list of absolutely gilt-edge securities. They'll bring you in a better rate of interest than we can possibly afford to give you. A troubled look settled on Mr Foreman's distinguished face. Uh, I've never had anything to do with stocks and shares. I'd have to leave it all in your hands, he said. The manager smiled. We'll do everything. All you'll have to do next time you come in is just to sign the transfers. I could do that all right, said Albert, uncertainly. But how should I know what I was signing? I suppose you can read, said the manager a trifle sharply. Mr Foreman gave him a disarming smile. Well, sir, that's just it. I can't. I know it sounds funny-like, but there it is. I can't read or write, only my name, and I only learnt to do that when I went into business. The manager was so surprised that he jumped up from his chair. That's the most extraordinary thing I've ever heard. 
you see it's like this sir I never had the opportunity until it was too late and then somehow I wouldn't I got obstinate like the manager stared at him as though he were a prehistoric monster and do you mean to say that you've built up this important business and amassed a fortune of £30,000 without being able to read or write? Good God, man, what would you be now if you had been able to? Well, I can tell you that, sir, said Mr Foreman, with a little smile on his still aristocratic features. I'd be verger of St Peter's Neville Square.